Hello and welcome to the reading of book 13. So we're on the back end of the Iliad readings now. And we're in the thick of the battle. We had Hector scaling the walls in book 12. Now we'll continue straight from that. Trojans are on the offensive. And we have the battle of the ships. And we're going to see Poseidon, because we're at the ships, we're going to see Poseidon come in to uh, rally the Greeks and aid the Greeks. But ultimately, this is just a continuation of the momentum we're getting towards book 16. And here is Chapman's argument. Neptune, in pity of the Greeks' hard plight, like Calchas, both the Iases doth excite, and others to repel the charging foe, Idomeneus bravely doth bestow his kingly forces and doth sacrifice Othryoneus to the destinies, the divers, others, fair Deiphobus. And his prophetic brother Helenus are wounded, but the great Priamides, gathering his forces, hardens their address against the enemy, and then the field, a mighty death on either side doth yield. Greeks, the Troy's bold power dismayed, are cheered up by Neptune's secret aid. Jove helping Hector and his host to thus close Achai fleet, he let them then their own strengths try, and season there their sweet. With ceaseless toils and grievances, for now he turned his face, looked down and viewed the far-off land of well rowed men in Thrace. Of the renowned, milk-nourished men, the Hippomolgians, long-lived, most just and innocent, and close-fought Mysians. Nor turned he any more to Troy his ever-shining eyes, because he thought. Not any one of all the dear ties, when his care left the indifferent field, would aid on either side. But this security in Jove, the great sea rector, spied, who sat aloft on the utmost top of shady, shady Samothrace, and viewed the fight. His chosen seat stood in so brave a place that Priam's city, the archive ships, all either did appear to his full view, who from the sea was therefore seated there. He took much ruth to see the Greeks by Troy sustain such ill. Mighty incensed with Jove, stooped straight from that steep hill, that shook as he flew off so hard, his parting pressed the height. The woods and all the great hills near trembled beneath the weight of his immortal moving feet. Three steps he only took, before he far off Agas reached, but with the fourth it shook with his dread entry. In the depth of those seas he did hold his bright and glorious palace, built of never-rusting gold, and there arrived he put in coach his brazen-footed steeds, all golden-maned, as paste with wings, and all in golden weeds. He clothed himself with golden scourge, most elegantly done. He took and mounted to his seat, and then the god begun to drive his chariot through the waves. From whirl pits every way, the whales exulted under him and knew their king, the sea for joy did open, and his horse so swift and lightly flew, the under axle tree of brass no drop of water drew. And thus these deathless coursers brought their king to the archive ships, twixt the imber cliffs and Tenedos, a certain cavern creeps into the deep sea's gulfy breast, and there the earth shaker stayed his forward steeds, took them from coach, heavenly fodder laid. And reached before them their brass hooves he girt with gyves of gold, not to be broken nor dissolved, but to make them firmly hold, a fit attendance on their king, who went to the archive host, which, like to tempests or wild flames, the clustering Trojans toast, insatiably valorous, in Hector's like command, high sounding and resounding shouts, for hope cheered every hand to make the Greek fleet now their prize and all the Greeks destroy. But Neptune, circler of the earth, with fresh heart did employ the Grecian hands in strength of voice. Body he did take, Calchas resemblance, and of all the Iases first bespake, who of themselves were free enough, the Iases you alone sustain the common good of Greece in ever putting on the memory of fortitude and flying shameful flight. Elsewhere the desperate hands of Troy could give me no affright. The brave Greeks have withstood their worst, but this our mighty wall being thus transcended by their power, grave fear doth much appall my careless spirits, 
Lest we feel some fatal mischief here, where Hector, raging like a flame, doth in his charge appear and boasts himself to the best god's son. Be you conceited so. Fire so. More than human spirits that God may seem to do. In your deeds, and with such thoughts cheered, others to such exhort and such resistance, these great minds will in as great a sort. Strengthen your bodies, and force to check to all great Hector's charge, though ne'er so spirit-like, and though Joe still passed himself enlarge his sacred actions. Thus he touched, with his forked scepter's point, the breast of both filled both their spirits and made a bevy joint with power responsive when hawk-like swift and set sharp to fly that fiercely stooping from a rock inaccessible and high cuts through a field and sets a foal not being of a kind hard and gets ground still neptune so left these two either's mind beyond themselves raised to both which ilius first discerned a uh, masking deity and said i act some god hath warned our powers to fight and save our fleet. He put him on the hue. The augur Calchas, by his pace in leaving us, I knew without all question, t'was a god. Gods are easily known. And in my tender breast I feel a greater spirit blown to execute affairs of fight. I find my hands so free to all high motion, and my feet seem feathered under me. This Telemonius thus received. So to my thoughts, my hands, burn with desire to toast my lance. Each foot beneath me stands bare on bright fire. To use his speed, my heart is raised so high. That to encounter Hector's self I long insatiably. While he's thus talked as overjoyed, steady for the fight, which God had stirred up in their spirits, and same God did excite. Greeks that were behind at fleet, refreshing their free hearts and joints, being even dissolved with toil and seeing the desperate parts played by the Trojans past their wall. Grief struck them in their eyes, swept tears from under their sad lids, their instant destined eyes, never supposing they could escape. But Neptune, stepping in with ease, stood up the able troops and did at first begin with Toyser and Penelaus, Thero, Laetus, Depirus, Meriones and young Antilochus, all expert in the deeds of arms. O oh, youths of Greece, said he, what change is this in your brave fight? I only look to see our fleet's whole safety. And if you neglect the harmful field, now shines the day when Greece to Troy must all her honours yield. No oh, grief. So great a miracle and horrible to sight. So now I see I never thought have profaned the light, the Trojans brave us at our ships, have been heretofore like faint and fearful deer in woods, distracted evermore with every sound, yet not scape, but prove the torn up fare of lynxes, wolves, and leopards, as never born to war, nor durst these Trojans at first siege in any least degree expect your strength or stand one shock of Grecian chivalry, yet now, now, far from their walls, they dare fight at our fleet maintained by all our general cowardice. That doth infect his men, who still at odds with him, for that will needs themselves neglect and suffer slaughter in their ships. Suppose there was the defect beyond all question in our king to wrong Achaeus. And he, for his part, particular weak from all assistance cease, we must not cease to assist ourselves. Give our general, then. Quickly, too, apt to forgive are all good-minded men. Yet you, quite void of their good minds, give good and you quite lost for ill in others, though ye be the worthiest of your host. As old as I am, I would scorn to fight with one that flies or leaves the fight as you do now. The general slothful lies. And you, though slothful, too, maintain with him a fight of spleen. Out, then, out, I hate ye from my heart. You rotten-minded men. And this ye add an ill that's worse than all your slots dislikes, but as I know to all your hearts my reprehension strikes, so thither let this shame strike too, for while you stand still here, a mighty fight swarms at your fleet. Great Hector raged there, that burst the long bar and the gates. Thus Neptune roused these men. And round about the ISEs did their phalanxes maintain their station firm from Mars himself, had he amongst them gone. Could not disparage nor Jove's maid that sets men fiercer on, for now the best were chosen out, and they received the advance. 
of Hector and his men so full that Lance was lined with Lance. Shields thickened with opposite shields. Targets to targets nailed. Helms struck to helms, and man to man grew they so close assailed. Plumed casks were hanged in either plumes, and all so close their stands, their lances stood thirst out so thick by such all daring hands, all bent their firm breasts to the point and made sad fight their joy of both. Troy all in heaps struck first, and Hector first of Troy. From his top torn when a shower poured from a bursting cloud hath broke the natural bond it held within the rough steep rock, and jumping it flies down the woods, resounding every shock, and on, unchecked, it headlong leaps till in a plain it stay, and then, though never so impelled, it stirs not any way. So, Hector, here two throated threats to go to sea in blood. And reached the Grecian ships and tents without being once withstood. But when he fell into the strength of Grecians, did maintain that they fought upon the square he stood and fettered then. And so adverse sons of Greece they laid on with swords and darts, whose both ends hurt that they repelled his worst. And he converts his threats by all means to retreats. Yet made as he retired only to encourage those behind, and thus those men inspired Trojans, Dardanians, Lycians. All warlike friends stand close, the Greeks can never bear me long, though tower-like they oppose. This lance, be sure, will be their spoil, if even the gods, the best of gods. High thundering Juno's husband stirs my spirit with true abodes. With this all strengths and minds he moved, but young Deiphobus, of Priam's son, amongst them all was chiefly virtuous, he bore before him his round shield tripped lightly through the priests, at all parts covered with his shield, and him, Meriones, charged with a glittering dart that took his bullhide orby shield, yet pierced it not, but in the top. Itself did piecemeal yield. The Ephibus thrust forth his charge and feared the broken ends of strong Meriones's lance, who now turned to his friends, the great hero scorning much by such a chance to part with lance of conquest. Forth he went to fetch another dart left at his tent. The rest fought on. The clamor heightened there was most unmeasured. Choicer first did flesh the massacre and slew a goodly man at arms, the soldier Imbrius, the son of Mentor, rich in horse. He dwelt at Pedasus before the sons of Greece sieged Troy, from whence he married Merisicast. One that sprung Priam's bastard bed. But when the Greek ship's double oared arrived at Ilion, to Ilion he returned and proved beyond comparison. Amongst the Trojans he was lodged with Priam, who held dear his natural sons no more than him, yet him beneath the ear the son of Telemann attained. Drew his lance, he fell. As when an ash on some hill's top, itself top wondrous well, the steel hews down, and he presents his young leaves to the soil. So fell he, and his fair arms groaned with toices longed to spoil. And in he ran, Hector in, who sent a shining lance at Toyser, who, beholding it, slipped by and gave a chance. An actor's son, Amphimachus, whose breast it struck and in flew Hector at his sounding fall with full intent to win, the tempting helmet from his head, the Ajax with a dart, Reached Hector at his rushing in, yet touched not any part of his body. It was hid quite through with horrid brass. The boss yet of his targe it took, whose firm stuff stayed in the pass. And he turned safe from both the trunks, both which the Grecians bore from off the field. Amphimachus Menestheus did restore, and Stichius to the Achaean strength. The Iases that were pleased, still most with most hot services, and Trojan Imbria seized. And as from sharply bitten hounds, a brace of lions force, a new slain goat and through the wood bear in their jaws the course aloft up into the air, so up into the skies bore both the Iases Imbrius and made his arm their prize. Not content, really, Ares, enraged to see their dead, his much beloved Amphimachus, he hewed off Imbrius's head, which swinging round, bowl like, he tossed amongst the Trojan priests. Followed Hector's Feet it fell, and Phimachus to cease. Being nephew to the god of waves, much vexed the deity's mind. To the ships and tents he marched, yet more to make inclined the Grecians to the Trojan main. Hasting to which end, Edimenius met with him, returning from a friend, 
whose ham late hurt his men brought off, and having given command to his physicians for his cure, much fur to put his hand to Troy's repulse, he left his tent. Him, like Andromon's son, Prince Thoas, that in Pluron ruled and lofty Calidon, that Tholian's powers, and like a god, was of his subjects loved. Neptune encountered. And but thus his forward spirit moved. Idomeneus, prince of Crete, or whither now are fled these threats in the and with the rest, the Trojans menace said, O oh, Thoas, he replied, no one of all our host stands now in any question of reproof, as I am let to know. Why is my intelligence false? We all know how to fight. And after fear this animating none, all do our knowledge right, nor can our harms accuse our sloth, not one from work we miss. The great God only works our ill, whose pleasure now it is. That far from home in hostile fields, with inglorious fate, some Greeks should perish. But do thou, O Thoas, that of late hast proved a soldier and was wont where thou hast sloth beheld, to chide it and exhort to pains, now hate to be repelled, and sent on all men, he replied, I would to heaven that he, whoever this day doth abstain from battle willingly, may never turn his face from Troy, but here become the prey and scorn of dogs. Come then, take arms, and let our kind essay. Join both our forces, though but two, yet, being both combined, the work of many single hands we may perform. We find that virtue co-augmented thrives in men of little mind, and we have singly matched the great. Thus said the god again. With all his conflicts visited the venturous flight of men. The king turned to his tent, rich arms put on his breast and tuck, two darts in hand, and forth he flew, his haste to mind him luck, much like a fiery meteor, with which Jove's sulfury hand opes heaven and hurls down the air bright flashes showing alland abodes that ever run before the tempest and plagues to men. So in his swift pace showed his arms, he wasn't counted then. But his good friend Meriones, yet near his tent to whom, thus spake the power of Edomen, what reason makes thee come? Thou son of Molus, my most loved, thus leaving fight alone. Is for some wound the javelin's head still sticking in the bone, as asked thou ease of, brinkst thou news, or what is it? Brings thy presence hither. Be assured my spirit needs no stings to this hot conflict. Of myself thou seest I come, I loathe, for any tense love to deserve the hateful taint of sloth. He answered, Only for a dart. He that retreat did make when any left at him his tent, for that he had a break on proud day of Abyss's shield. Is one dart all? said he. Take one and twenty if thou like, for in my tent they be. They stand. There, shining by the walls, I took them in my prize. From false Trojans I have slain, and this is not the guise of one that loves his tent or fights afar off with his foe. But since I love the fight, therefore doth martial star bestow. Besides those darts, helms, targets, bossed, and corslets bright as day. So I, said Marion, at my tent and sable bark my say. Many Trojan spoils retain, but now not near they be, to serve me for my present use, and therefore ask I thee. Not that I lack a fortitude to store me with my own, for ever in the foremost fights that render men renown, I fight when any fight doth stir. This perhaps may well be hid to others, but thou knowst, and I to thee appear. I know replied the king how much thou wastest in every worth what needst thou therefore utter this if we should now choose forth the worthiest men for ambushes in all our fleet and host for ambushes are services that try men's virtue most since there the fearful and the firm will as they are appear and fearful altering still his hue and rests not anywhere or is his spirit capable of the ambush constancy but riseth, changeth still his place, and croucheth curiously. On his bent haunches, half his height scarce, seen above the ground, for fear to be seen, yet must see. His heart with many a bold offering to leap out of his breast, and ever fearing death, the coldness of it makes him gnash, and half shakes out his teeth, 
where men of valor neither fear nor ever change their looks from lodging the ambush till it rise but since there must be strokes wish to be quickly in their midst by strength and hand and these who should reprove for if far off or fighting in the priest thou shouldst be wounded i am sure the dart that gave the wound should not be drawn out of thy back or make thy neck the ground but meet thy belly or thy breast in thrusting further yet when thou art furthest till the first and before him thou get put on children let us not stand bragging thus but do lest some here Pass the measured shy that we stand still and woo. Go choose a better dart and make Mars yield a better chance. This said, Mars swift Marionis with haste a brazen lance. Took from his tent and overtook most careful of the wars, Idomeneus, and such too in field as harmful Mars and terror his beloved son, that with her terror fights and is of such strength that in war the frighter he affrights. When out of Thrace, they both make arms against the Ephraim bands or against the great soul Phlegians, nor favor their own hands, but give to grace to others still, and such sort out the fight. March these two managers of men in armors full of light, and first spake of Merion. On which part, son of Deucalion, serves thy mind to invade the fight is best to set upon? The Trojans in our battles, a the right or left hand wing, for all parts, I suppose, employed this Cretan king. And thus answered, In our navy's midst are others that assist, the two Iases, choice of two, and shafts that expertist. Of all the Grecians, and those small, as great in fights of stand, and these, though huge he be of strength, will serve to fill the hand of Hector's self, the Priamist, that studier for blows. It shall be called a deed, height for him. Even suffering throws for knocks still out, out labor them, bettering through tough hands and flame our feet. Well, if Jove himself cast not his firebrands amongst our navy, that affair no man can bring to field. Great Ajax Telemonius to none alive will yield, and yields to death. And whose life takes Ceres' nutritions that can be cut with any iron, parched with mighty stones. Not to Iachides himself he yields for combat set, though clear he must give place for pace, the free swing of his feet. Since then the battle being our place of most care is made good by his high valour, let our aid see all his powers be withstood. The charge the left wing, to that let us direct our course, where quickly feel we this hot foe, or make him feel our force. This ordered, swift Meriones went, and forewent his king, till both arrived where one enjoined, when in the Greeks' left wing. The Trojans saw the Cretan king like fire and fortitude, and his attendant in bright arms so gloriously endued, both cheering the sinister troops all that the king addressed, and so the skirmish at their sterns on both parts were increased, that as from hollow bustling winds engendered storms arise, when dust doth chiefly clog the ways which up into the skies the wanton tempest ravisheth, Begetting night of day, so came together both the foes, both lusted to assay, and work with quick steel either's death, man fierce, corruptress fight. Set up a bristles in the field with lances long and light, which thick fell foul on either's face, the splendor of the steel, and new scored curates, radiant casks, and burnished shields did seal. The assailer's eyes up. He sustained a huge spirit that was glad. To see that labor, or in soul that stood not stricken sad, thus these two disagreeing gods, old Saturn's mighty sons, afflicted these heroic men with huge oppressions. Jove, honoring Iachides, to let the Greeks still try their want without him, would bestow yet still the victor eye on Hector and the Trojan power, yet for Iachides, and honor of his mother queen, great goddess of the sea would not let proud Ilion see the Grecians quite destroyed, and therefore from the hoary deep he suffered so employed. Great Neptune in the Grecian aid, grieved for them and stormed extremely at his brother Jove, yet both one goddess formed and one soil bred. But Jupiter precedence took in birth and had more knowledge for which cause the other came not forth. 
of his wet kingdom, but with care of not being seen to excite, to excite the Grecian hosts, and like a man appeared and made the flight. So these gods made men's valors great, but equaled them with war. As harmful as their hearts were good, and stretched those chains as far on both sides as their limbs could bear, and which they were involved, past breach or loosing, that their knees might therefore be dissolved. Then, though a half grey man he were, Crete sovereign did excite the Grecian Greeks to blows and flow up Trojans even to flight. For here, in sight of all the hosts, Othryonia slew that from Cabasus. With the fame of those wars, thither drew his new-come forces and required without respect of dower. Cassandra fair to Priam's race, assuring with his power a mighty labor to expel in their despite from Troy the sons of Greece. The king did vow that done he should enjoy his goodliest daughter. He, in trust, of that fair purchase fought. At him threw the Cretan king a lance that singled out the greater humor, whom it struck just in his naval stead. His brazen curates, helping naught, resigned him to the dead. Then did the conqueror exclaim, and thus insulted then, O Threonius, I will praise beyond all mortal men. Thy living virtues, if thou wilt, now perfect the brave vow. Thou mates to Priam, for the wife he promised to bestow, and where he should have kept his word, there we assure thee here, to give thee for thy princely wife the fairest and most dear of our great general's female's race, which from his Argive hall... We all will wait upon to Troy, if with our aids and all thou wilt but raise this well-built town. Come, therefore, follow me, that in our ships we may conclude this royal match with thee. I'll be no jot worse than my word. With that he took his feet, dragged him through the fervent fight, in which did Asius meet, the victor to inflict revenge. He came on foot before his horse that on his shoulders breathed so closely evermore. His coachman led them to his lord who held a huge desire to strike the king, but he struck first and underneath his chin at his throat sight. Through the other side his eager lance drove in and down he bustled like an oak, a poplar, a pine, hewn down for shipwood and so lay his false and fall did so decline. The spirit of his charioteer, that lest he should incense the victor to impair his soil, he durst not drive from thence his horse and chariot, and so pleased with that respective part, Antilochus, that for his fear he reached him with a dart, without his belly's midst, and down his side course fell beneath, the richly builded chariot there laboring at his breath. The horse uh, Antilochus took off, when grieved for this event, Deiphobus drew passing near, and at the victor sent a shining javelin, which he saw and shunned with gathering round his body in all round shield, at whose top with a sound it overflew, yet seizing there it did not idly fly. From him that winged it, his strong hand drave still mortal eye, on prince hips and oar it did pierce his liver underneath. The veins it passeth, his shrunk knee submitted him to death. And then did love Deiphobus miraculously vaunt. Now Asius lies not on revenge, nor doth his spirit want. The joy I wish it, though it be now entering the strong gate of mighty Pluto, since his hand hath sent him down a mate. Of Marshal Antilochus, who though the grief inclined, he left not yet his friend, but ran and hid him with his shield. And to him came two lovely friends that freed from him the field, uh, mit Mechisteus, son of Echius, and the right nobly born Alistair, bearing him to fleet, did extremely mourn. Yes, we had Idomeneus, sunk not yet, but held his nerves entire, his mind much less deficient. Being fed with firm desire to hide more Trojans in dim night, or sink himself in guard of his loved countrymen, and then Alcathos prepared, work for his valour, offering fate his own destruction, a great hero and had grace to be the loved son of Aesietes, son-in-law to Prince Aeneas' sire, Hippodamia marrying who most inflamed the fire of her dear parents' love and took the precedence in her birth of all their daughters and as much exceeded in her worth. 
For beauty answered with her mind, and both with house were free. All the fair beauty of young dames that used her company, and therefore being the worthiest dame, the worthiest man did wed. Of ample Troy, him Neptune stood beneath the royal force, of Edom and his sparkling eyes deluding, and the course of his illustrious lineaments so out of nature bound, that back nor forward he could stir, but as he grew to ground, stood like a pillar, high tree, and neither moved nor feared, when straight to royal Cretan's darts in his mid-breast appeared to break the curates, that were proof to every other dart, but now the cleft and rung, the lance stuck shaking in his heart, his heart with panting made it shake. But Mars did now remit the greatness of it, and the king, now quitting the brag fit of glory in Dephibus, thus terribly exclaimed, Dephibus, now may we think that we are evenly famed, that three for one have sent to Dece. But come, change blows with me, thy vaunts for him thou slutst to vain. Come, wretch, thou mayst see what issue Jove hath. Jove begot Minos and strength of Crete. Minos begot Deucalion. Deucalion did beget me, Idomen. Now, Crete's king, that here my ships are brought to bring thyself, thy father's friends, all Ilian's pomp to naught. Deiphobus, a two ways stood in doubt to call someone with some retreat to be his aid or try the chance alone. At last, the first seemed best to him. And back he went to call and kisses his son to friend. He stood the troop last of all, where still he served, which made him still incense against the king, that being amongst his best their peer, he graced not anything, his wrong desert. Deiphobus spake to him, standing near. Aeneas, prince of Troyans, if any touch appear of glory in thee, thou must now assist my thy sister's lord. And one that to thy tenderest youth did careful guard afford. Alcathos, whom Cretus king hath chiefly slain to thee, his right most challenging thy band, come therefore follow me. This much excited his good mind, and set his heart on fire against the Cretan, who childlike dissolved not in his ire, but stood him firm. As when in hills strength relying bore, alone and hearing hunters come, whom tumult flies before, up thrusts his bristles, wits his tusks, sets fire on his red eyes, and in his brave prepared repulse doth dogs and men despise. So stood the famous for his lance, nor shunned the coming charge that resolute Aeneas brought, yet since the odds was large. He called with good right to his aid, war-skilled Ascalaphus, Apharius, Marianus, the strong Deiparus, and Nestor's honourable son. Come near, my friends, said he, and add your aids to me alone. Fear tents me worthily, though firm I stand, and show it not. Aeneas, great in fight, and one that bears youth in his flower, that bears the greatest might, comes on with aim direct at me. Had I his youthful limb to bear in mind, he should feel, feel fame, or I would yield it him. This said, all held, and many souls, one ready, helpful mind. Clapped shields and shoulders, and stood close, Aeneas not inclined, with more presumption than the king called aid as well as he, divine Agenor, Helen's love, who followed instantly, and all their forces following them, as after bell weathers. The whole flock follow to their drink, which sight the shepherd cheers. Nor was Aeneas's joy less moved to see such troops attend, his honoured person, and all these fought close about his friend, but two of them, past all the rest, had strong desire to shed the blood of either, as Edomen and Cytherea's seed. Aeneas first bestowed his lance, which the other seeing shunned, and that thrown from an idle hand struck trembling in the ground, but Edomen's discharged at him, had no such vain success, which Enomaus's entrails found, in which it did impress his sharp pile to his fall. His palms tore his returning earth. Enomaus straight stepped in and plucked his javelin forth, but could not spoil his goodly arms, they pressed him so with darts. But now the long toil of the fight had spent its vigorous parts and made them less apt to avoid the foe that should advance 
or when himself advanced again to run and fetch his lance, and therefore, in stiff fights of stand, he spent a cruel day, when coming softly from the slain, Deiphobus gave way to his bright javelin at the king, whom he could never brook. But then he lost his envy too, his lance yet deadly took, as Scalaphus, the son of Mars, quite through his shoulder flew, the violent head, and down he fell nor yet by all means knew, wide-throated Mars, his son was fallen, but in Olympus's top sat canopied with golden clouds, Jove's council had shut up, both him and all the other gods, from that time's equal task, which now both, as Scalaphus strife set his shining cask, Deiphobus had forced from him, but instantly leaped in Mars swift Marionis, and struck with his long javelin. The right arm, of Deiphobus, which made his hand let fall the sharp-topped helmet, pressed earth resounding therewithal. When vulture-like Marianus rushed in again and drew, from out the low part of his arm his javelin and then flew back to his friends. Deiphobus, faint with the blood's excess, fallen from his wound, was carefully conveyed out of the press by his kind brother, by both sides, Polites, till they got his horse and chariot that was still set fit for his retreat, bore him now to Ilion. The rest fought fiercely on, set a mighty fight on foot, when next and kisses his son, Aferius Calatorides, ran upon him, struck just in the throat, his keen lance and straight his head forsook, his upright carriage and his shield, his helm, and all with him fell to earth where ruinous death made prize of every limb. Antilochus, discovering well that Thoen's heart took check, let fly and cut the hollow vein that runs up to his neck. Along his back part, quite in twain, down in the dust he fell, upwards and with extended hands, bade all the word farewell. Antilochus rushed nimbly in, and lucking round made prize of his fair arms, in which affair his round-set enemies let fly their lances thundering on his advanced targe, but could not get his flesh. The god that shakes the earth took charge of Nestor's son, and kept him safe, who never was away, but still amongst the thickest foes was busy lance did play, observing ever when he might far off or near offend, and watching Asius' son, in praise he spied him and did ascend. Close coming on, a dart at him that smote in midst his shield in which the sharp head of the lance, the blue-haired god made yield, not pleased to yield his pupil's life, in whose shield half the dart struck like a trunch and burned the fire on earth lay the other part, but seeing no better end of all, retired in fear of worse. But him Marionis pursued, and his lance found full course to the other's life. It wound him betwixt the privy parts, a navel where to wretched men that war's most violent smarts must undergo wounds chiefly vex. His dart Marionus pursued, and Adamus so strived with it and his misease. As doth a bullock puff and storm who in disdained bands the upland herdsmen strive to cast. So fallen beneath the hands of his stern foe, as the adders did struggle, pant and rave, but no long time, for when the lance was plucked up out, Ah, he gave his tortured soul when Troy's turn came, when with a Thracian sword the temples of Deiprus did Hellenus afford. So huge a blow it struck all light out of his cloudy eyes and cleft his helmet, which a Greek there fighting made his prize. It fell so beneath his feet. Atrides, grieved to see that sight and threatening, shook a lance at Hellenus and he. A bow half drew at him at once, out flew both shaft and lance. The shaft of Tredes' curate struck, and far away did glance at Tredes' dart of Hellenus, the thrust out bow hand struck, and through the hand struck in the bow. Agenor's hand did pluck. From forth the nailed prisoner, the javelin quickly out. And fairly with a little wool and wrapping round about, the wounded hand within a scarf he bore it, which is squire and ready for him. The wound would needs he should retire. Pisander to revenge his hurt. Right on the king ran he. A bloody fate suggested him to let him run on thee. Oh, Menelaus, that he might by thee 
In dangerous war, be done to death, both coming on, Atreides is lanced at Ur. Bissander struck Atreides' shield. That break at point the dart, not running through, yet he rejoiced as playing a victor's part. Atreides, drawing his fair sword upon Bissander, flew. Yeah, Bissander, from beneath his shield, his goodly weapon drew, two edged with right sharp steel, and long the handle olive tree. Well polished, and to blows they go, upon the top struck he, Atreides' horsehair feathered helm, Atreides and his brow. Above the extreme part of noise laid such a heavy blow, that all bones crashed under it, and out his eyes did drop. Before his feet, in dust, bloody dust, he after and shrunk up his dying body. Which the foot of his triumphing foe opened and stood upon his breast, and off his arms did go. This insultations us the while. At length forsake our fleet. I see false Trojans to whom war never enough is sweet. Nor want ye more impieties with which ye have abused. Me, ye bold dogs, that your chief friends so honourably used. Nor fear you, hospitable Jove, that let such thunders go, but built a bond. He will embuild your towers that clamour so, for ravishing my goods, my wife flower of all her years, and without cause. Nay, that fair and liberal hand of hers had used you so most lovingly, and now again you would cast fire into our fleet. Kill our princes if ye could. Go to, and one day you will be curbed, though never so ye thirst. Rude war by war, O Father Jove, they say thou art the first, in wisdom of all the gods and men. Yet all this comes from thee. Still thou gratifiest. These men, how lewd soe'er they be. For never, never they be cloyed with sins, nor can be satiate, as good men should with this vile war. Satiety of state, satiety of sleep and love, satiety of ease. Musing, dancing can find place, yet harsh war still must please. Past all these pleasures, even past these. They will be cloyed with these before their war joys. Never war gives Troy satieties. This said, the bloody arms were offed, and to his shoulder, soldiers thrown. He mixing in first fight again, and then Harpalion, kind King Pelimon's son, gave charge, who to those wars of Troy his loved father followed, and never did enjoy his country's sight again. He struck the charge of Atreus' son, while in the midst his javelin steel yet had no power to run, a target through. Nor had himself the heart to fetch his lance, but tuck him to his strength, and cast on every side a glance, lest any his dear sides should dart. But Merion, as he fled, sent after him a brazen lance that ran his eager head, through his right hip, and all along the bladder's region, beneath the bone it settled him, and set him spirit gone. Monks the hands of his best friends, and like a worm he lay, stretched on earth, with his black blood embrued and flowed away. His course the Paphlagonians did sadly wait upon, reposed in his rich chariot to sacred Ilion. The king his father following dissolved in kindly tears, and no rake sought for his slain son, but at his slaughterers incensed Paris spent a lance since he had been a guest to many Paphlagonians, and through the priest had pressed. There was a certain augur's son that did for wealth excel, and yet was honest he was born and did at Corinth dwell, who, though he knew his harmful fate, would needs his ship ascend. His father, Polydius, oft would lay, tell him that his end would either seize him at his house upon a sharp disease, or else among the Grecian ships by Trojans slain. Both these together he desired to shun. But the disease at last, and lingering death in it, he left in war's quick stroke embraced. The lance betwixt his ear and cheek ran in and drave the mind of both those bitter fortunes out. Night struck his whole powers blind. Thus fought they, like the spirits of fire. Nor Jove loved Hector knew how in the fleet left wing the Greeks his down put soldiers slew almost to victory. The god that shakes the earth so well helped with his own strength, and the Greeks so fiercely did impel, yet Hector made their first place good, where both the ports and wall, 
The thick rank of the Greek shields broke, he entered and its score. Whereon the grey seas shore were drawn, the wall being there but slight. Protesilaus's ships and those of Ajax were the fight, of men and horse were sharpest set. There the Boeotians' bands, long robbed Aeons, Locrians, and brave men of their hands. The Pythian and Epean troops did spritefully assail, the godlike Hector rushing in and yet could not prevail. To his repulse, tough choice men of Athens there made head, amongst whom was Menestheus, chief whom Phidias followed. Stichius and Bias, huge in strength, the Epian troops were led by Megas' and Philidus' cares and Amphion Brachius. Before the Pythians, Medon marched and Menoptolemus, these with the Boeotians' powers bore up the fleet's defense. Oelius, by his brother's side, stood close, but uh, not thence, for any moment of that time, but as through follow fields, black oxen draw a well-joined plough, and eye that evenly yields. His thrifty labour, all heads couched so close to earth they plough. They follow with their horns, till out the sweat begins to flow, the stretched yokes crack, and yet at last the furrow forth is driven. So toughly stood these to their task, and made their workers even. But Ajax Telamonius had many helpful men. But when a sweat ran bout his knees, and laboured flown would then help bear his mighty sevenfold shield, when swift Oileares the Locrians left, and would not make these mutrous fights of priests. Because they wore no bright steel casks, nor bristle plumps for show, round shields, nor darts of solid ash, but with the trusty bow, and jacks well quitted with soft wool, they came to Troy, and were in their fit place, as confident as those that fought so near, and reached their foes so thick with shafts, that these were they that break the Trojan orders first, and then the brave armed men did make good work with their close fights before, behind whom, having shot, the Locrians did uh, hit still, and their foes all thought of fight forgot. With shows of that for far striking shafts, their eyes were troubled so. And then assuredly, from the ships and tents, the insulting foe had miserably fled to Troy, had not Polydemus thus spake to Hector. Hector, still impossible it is to pass. Good counsel upon you. But say some. God prefers thy deeds, and counsels wilt thou not pass us too. In all things none exceeds. To some God gives the power of war, to some the sleight of dance. Some the art of instruments, some doth for voice advance. And that far-seeing God grants some the wisdom of mind, which no man can keep to himself that though but few can find, doth profit many that preserves the public weal and sate. And that who hath he best can prize, but for me, I'll relate. Only my censure, what's our best, the very crown of war doth burn about thee. Yet our men, when they have reached thus far, suppose their valorous crown and cease. A few still stir their feet, and so a few with many fights burst thinly through the fleet. Retire then, leave speech to the rout, and all thy princes call, that here in councils of most weight we may resolve of all, if having likelihood to believe that God will conquest give, we shall charge through, or with his grace make our retreat and live. For I must needs affirm, I fear the debt of yesterday. Since war is such a god of change, the Grecians now will pay. Since the insatiate man of war remains at fleet, if there we tempt his safety, no hour more his hot soul can forbear. This sound stuff Hector liked, approved, jumped from his chariot, and said, Polydemus, make good this place, and suffer not one prince to pass it. I myself will go there, where you see those friends in skirmish, and return, when they have heard from me, command that your advice obeys with utmost speed, this said, with day bright arms, white plume, white scarf, with godly limbs arrayed. He parted from them like a hill, removing all of snow, and to the Trojan peers and chiefs he flew to let them know the council of Polydemus, 
all turned and did rejoice to haste to Panthus's gentle son being called by Hector's voice. Who, through the four fights making way, looked for Deiphobus, King Helenus, Asiades, Hertesian Asias, of whom some were now to be found unhurt or undeceased, some only hurt and gone from a field, as further he addressed, he found within the fight's left wing the fair haired Helen's love, by all means moving men to blows which could by no means move. Hector's forbearance, his friends miss, so put his powers in storm. But thus in wanted terms he chid, you with the finest form, imposter, woman's man. Where are in your care marked all these Deiphobus, King Elenus, Asius Hertikides, Othrionius Achamus, now haughty Ilion, shakes to his lowest groundwork, now just ruins fall upon thy head past rescue. He replied, Hector, why chides thou now? And I'm guiltless. Other times there are for ease, I know, than these. For she that brought thee forth now utterly left me, without some portion of thy spirit, to make me brother thee. But since thou first brought in thy force to this our naval fight, I and my friends have ceaseless fought to do thy service right. All those friends thou seekst are slain, excepting Helenus, who parted wounded in his hand, and so... Deiphobus, Jove yet averted death from them, and now lead thou as far as thy great heart affect, or we will second any war. Thou endurest, and I hope my own strength is not lost. The least I'll fight it to his best, no further fights the most. This calmed hot Hector in his spleen. And both turned where they saw the face of war most fierce, and that was where their friends made good the place about renowned Polydemus and godlike Pelopete, Palmus, Ascanius, Morus, Hippotion did beget, and from Ascanius' wealthy fields, but even the day before arrived at Troy, with their aid they kindly might restore some kindness they received from thence, and in fierce fight with these, Palcus and tall Erthius stood in bold Cabrionese. Then the doubt. And in the advice Palidimus disclosed, to fight or fly, Jove took away and all the fight disposed. And as the floods of troubled air to pitchy storms increase, and after thunder sweeps the fields and ravish up the seas, encountering with abhorred roars when the engrossed waves boil into the foam and endlessly one after the other raves, so ranked and guarded Thilian's march, some now, more now, and then... More upon more, in shining steel now captains and their men, and Hector like man killing Mars advanced before them all, his huge round target before him, through thickened like a wall, with hides well couched with store of brass, and on his temples shined his bright helm on which danced his plume, and in his torrid kind, all hid within his world like shield, he every troop assayed for entry, that in his despite stood for firm and undismayed, which, when he saw and kept more off, Ajax came stalking then, and thus provoked. O good man, why frights thou thus our men? Come nearer. Now art want in war makes us thus navy bound, but Jove direct scourge, his armed hand makes our hands give you ground. If thou hopes of thyself are spoil, but we have likewise hands to hold our own as you to spoil an heir to canter man's. Stand good against our ransacked fleet, you hugely peopled town. Our hands shall take in and her towers from all our heights pull down. And I must tell thee, time draws on when flying thou shalt cry to Jove and all the gods that make Thy fair manned horses fly more swift than falcons, that their hooves may rouse the dust and bear thy body hid to Ilion. This said his bold words bar. Confirmed as soon as spoke, Jove's bird, the high flown eagle, took the right hand of their host, whose wings high acclamation struck from forth the glad breasts of the Greeks. Then Hector made reply, Vain spoken man and glorious. What hast thou said? Would I, as surely, while the son of Jove and of great Juno born, adorn like Pallas and the god that lifts the earth to mourn? 
as this day shall bring harmful light to all your host and thou, if thou dare stand his lance, the earth before the ships shall strow, thy bosom torn up, and the dogs with all the fowl of Troy be satiate with thy fat and flesh. This said with shouting joy, his first troops followed, and the last their shouts with shouts repelled. Greeks answered all, nor could his spirits from all show rest concealed. And to so infinite a height all acclamation strove. They reached the splendors stuck about the unreached throne of Jove.